Hi, welcome to an all new season of Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Veera. I'd like to give a very special shout out to our podcast partner who's been with us for almost 3 seasons now. Perpetual Buzz Experiences. You can check them out on www.perpetualbuzz.com. 2023 was such an incredible year with several noteworthy highlights. The podcast won the Hub Hopper Podcast Award for the best interview podcast of 2023. followed by live podcast formats that happened in Bombay at the NCPA International Jazz Festival where we had some incredible musicians on the podcast like Alfredo Rodriguez and we also had a live format at the Snarky Puppy India Tour featuring Jason Thomas and Mark Latery and the one and only Steve Vai's India Tour I'd like to show you all a little sneak peek of what happened in 2023. Paul Gilbert. Hello everybody, this is Purbain Chatterjee. I'm Ludovic Cagnaudi. I'm Hi, this is Antonio Sanchez. In India, this is Jordan Rudis. And this is Adrian Vandenberg. Today is Tori Sykes. This Hey, this is this Rhonda Smith. Hi, I'm Harold Faltermeyer. This is Dave Weckley. Hi, this is Bill Fazell. Hey, this is Julian Gigliani. You're watching Stewards of Music with Aditya Vera. You're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. Well, you're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. And you're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. And you're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. Hello, India. Hello, Bharat. I will be talking to Aditya Vera for his series Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. to know that. that. Yeah, it's, it's it's by far one of the most intelligent interviews. An interesting an interesting choice of questions. Uh very well presented. I like where you're coming from and your your uh your questions and you've done your research and your It was a pleasure to discuss uh, all the, those uh, great topics uh, yeah. that yeah. you um you you put on the table and uh, I was lucky to be with you in this hour I spent a beautiful hour with you thank you very nice interview i am very happy that your questions were very very nice and uh, even you are so young you have the depth and uh, you have uh, the knowledge so i congratulate you adit he is connecting people from this side of the globe to the other side of the globe he's doing an amazing job i would kindly request that you all check out It, Aditya Vera on his Instagram and his YouTube channel. His Instagram, I think, is A D I X seven zero seven zero. So give it up for Aditya Vera, everyone. Go check it out. Season three, twenty twenty four, seems quite promising already. I am going to be bringing to you the best of artists in every possible genre on this planet. I'd like to give a very special mention for the much awaited Mahindra Blues Festival marking its 12th year which returns on the 10th and 11th of February 2024 at Mumbai's Mehboob Studio. 
It's a pivotal part of Asia's blues scene and India's blues movement. The festival has been a platform for both global and homegrown blues talent. Mahindra's consistent support for arts and culture is evident through a 11-year commitment to providing unparalleled blues experience for the people of Bombay and beyond. The festival has hosted legends in the past like Buddy Guy, John Mayall and Taj Mahal. I'm delighted to inform you all that Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Veera is partnering with Hyperlink Brand Solutions for a one-of-a-kind festival edition podcast featuring three incredible artists who are going to be playing at the Mahindra Blues Festival. So I'm going to be interviewing Dana, Vanessa Collier, and Samantha Fish. The episodes will be out on 21st January, 28th January, and 4th February exclusively on my YouTube channel, Aditya Veera1994. If you haven't subscribed yet, go for it. Don't forget to get your tickets for the festival on the 10th and 11th. Ticket links are mentioned in my description. So stay tuned for the festival edition podcast, like I mentioned. So the episodes will be out once again on, on, on the 21st of January, 28th of January and 4th February at 6 p.m. IST, 12.30 p.m. GMT. So please don't miss it. The National Center of Performing Arts in Mumbai announces the fifth edition of Mumbai's dance season starting from January 18th to the 4th of February 2024. This is an 18-day cultural celebration featuring 27 events showcasing over 100 classical dancers. The initiative aims to unite various Indian classical dance forms through performances, lecture demonstrations, workshops and masterclasses that will be taking place all across Mumbai, Greater Mumbai and Navi Mumbai. This is being co-curated by several noteworthy artists such as Jayashree Nair, Lata Rajesh and the season will offer a diverse range of performances including choreography based on Tamil literature and a Kathak tribute to Pandit Briju Maharaj. Don't forget to attend the festival and the ticket details are on the description. Speaking of my guest today is none other than Simon Phillips, who is a Grammy Award nominated drummer, producer and composer. He's regarded as one of the world's most renowned and respected drummers. Simon's style not only reflects his technical gift, but also his distinct musical sensibilities. Whether it's rock, fusion or jazz, Simon applies the same precision and intensity to his drumming, which is never lacking in emotion or feel. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, Simon has worked with rock bands and artists including the legendary Jeff Beck, Nick Kershaw, Mike Oldfield, Judas Priest, Mike Rutherford, Tears for Fears, 10CC, The Who, and even Toto. After Jeff Porcaro's death in 1992, he became one of the world-famous drummers as we'd like to call till today for the band Toto. After leaving the group in 2014, Simon ventured into the fusion and progressive rock worlds, both as a drummer and a producer. Without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome my guest for today, Simon Phillips. Hello, my name is Simon Phillips and you are listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Veera. Hi Simon, Namaste, welcome to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Veera Season 3. It's such an incredible privilege to have you on the show, sir. Uh, my pleasure. <laughs> Good to be on the show. Where are you right now? Which, which part of the world are you in? I'm in Southern California. I'm in a place called Ojai, California, which is about 65 miles from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, north, uh, northwest of uh, L.A., okay. uh, near Santa Barbara. It's about a, an hour away from Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. um, an hour from Ventura. Uh, it's a very... It's a very special place. It's, I'm right in the countryside here. Okay. Uh, it's absolutely lovely. Yeah. 
there's there's more animals than people here. Oh wow, incredible! And I get I get visits from a bear sometimes. Oh wow, uh, that can be scary. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He he's he, he's been here a couple of times. He jumps over the fence and he goes through my trash. So I've had to invent bear locks. <laughs> oh okay. Oh yeah, it's exciting around here. Uh, mountain lions too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's lovely. I I, I love it. Actually, I love it here. So do do you have any pets uh, around you other than I, wildlife? Well, there's loads of pets in the other houses, but uh, okay. I don't um, mainly because um, uh, if I travel, you know, and I travel a lot or used to anyway. Um, so uh, I just felt at the moment best to 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 not have a pet that I have to leave and then come back to, and you know. Great. What's happening in terms of music? What are you? What are you up to these days? Nothing. Just taking it easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm actually uh, um, quite busy. Okay. Um, mostly, I'm in the recording world these days. Okay. Uh, which means either I'm playing uh, sessions for other artists mm-hmm. and producers. Um, I'm doing a lot of producing. Mm-hmm. And quite a bit of uh, engineering, which which means a lot of mixing for people. Okay. Okay. So um, my main projects are probably production, where I'm involved in the in the whole you know recording of the record, and then um, coordinating all the musicians and uh, arranging, and sometimes even composing, and then engineering the sessions, and then uh, mixing mixing the final uh, uh, record. So, but I also uh, do sessions for other people because I, I actually really enjoy doing that. I just enjoy making records. Um, the only touring I do these days is with my own band, with Protocol. Okay. And uh, since COVID, uh, we, we, we've we done a little bit, but we haven't done as much as maybe I would like to just okay. because it's just, you know, it's, it's just been hard to get up and running with, um, you know, getting the right tours put together. And now, of course, state of the world we have this war in the ukraine and then we have you know yeah. israel the gaza thing um it's actually affecting a lot of people's uh budgets in terms of the jazz festivals concerts generally so um but we're working on it hopefully to do some uh um uh, we, we we do have a couple of tours lined up this year japan and europe um so uh yeah hopefully yeah anything in india Sadly, no. I would love to come back to India. Uh, and I think this band, people would love this band in India. Totally, totally. It's just, um, yeah, I guess, um, you know, I need a, a promoter uh, that will, you know, put on some shows to make it worthwhile. Um, kind of waiting for that to happen, actually. So if you know anybody. <laughs> sure, sure. I'd be happy to host you in my country. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. not just music, but I'd, I'd love to sort of show you around uh, I live in the southern part of India. I live in a city called uh, Coimbatore, which is in Tamil yeah. Nadu, which is in, in the southern tip of India. And right. uh, yeah, and I would love to love to show you around here. Uh, I don't know if 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 you've ever heard of Sadhguru. So Sad, Sadhguru's got like a very big yoga foundation over here, which is right. called uh, uh, Isha Yoga. So the right. Isha Yoga Center is right here. So it's, oh, it's, wow. it's, it's a very wow. beautiful city. Yeah, I've never been to the south. I I went mm. um, uh, 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 Zakir Zakir Hussein. Can he I... invited me over for uh, a concert. For it's a memorial concert he holds. I think every year or every other year. Yeah. yeah. Father, um, and that was uh, that was a few years ago, twenty fifteen maybe. Can't mm. actually remember. Um, and so I was in Mumbai for a little bit, and I I said to Zakir, look, I just want to see some of India. Yeah. And so uh, he kind of planned the trip, and I went to Agra, saw the Taj Mahal, um, uh, uh, little, uh, went went up to um, oh gosh, memory uh, the, the the Golden Temple, yeah, Amritsar, uh, Amritsar, thank you, uh, up to the Paki border, and and it was lovely, absolutely, yeah. just a, a quick, wasn't you know, it wasn't that long, but uh, I got to see and experience a little bit of India. But I think more importantly, I got to experience some of the amazing uh, drummers there, tabla players and yeah. music, 
which I love. I mean, I've, I've actually loved Indian music for a long time, um, mainly because actually of John McLaughlin. Mm. Because I'm a huge fan, originally of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. I loved the the introduction of Indian type of music with Western music. Yeah. I thought was fantastic. And on the uh, short occasions that I've had to talk to John, um, you know, I've asked him a lot about, you know, how he got into studying Indian music and all this stuff. And you might see behind me that. Yeah, the cover, album cover. Yeah. Right, which is uh, with uh, Mahadevan and um, and uh, Zakir and John. It's right. probably one of the most favorite albums of all time now. It's mm. just absolutely gorgeous. And I wrote to John and he, I said, how did you put this together? I'm just so curious. And he told yeah. me it took a long time. And there was quite a quite a bit of reworking stuff, and yeah. but I'm, I'm I'm a huge fan of Mahadevan. I think it's incredible, you know. So yeah. and I got to see them play Shakti, Shakti. play yeah. at the at the, the memorial. So, yeah, mm. and that was with the uh, use uh, Srivanas too when he was still alive. Mandalay and uh, oh, yeah. he was amazing, absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, big 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 fan. Yeah. So I, I guess it's time for you to plan another trip. I'd be happy to put you in touch with some promoters. Let's let's take it from there. Yeah. Oh, would love to. Absolutely would love to. Yeah. Great. So I have uh, a very interesting agenda planned as we discussed earlier. So shall we get started? Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Already. So Simon, I'd like to know if you have a sense of history, of eternity, of immortality in terms of musical compositions that you create say that uh, they might live for the next 100 years. Do you, do you make it with that vision? No, I don't think of it in that way at all. Mm. However, what, I've, uh, what we've all discovered, especially the way that the music business has changed, um, we, music is lasting a long time. In right. terms of pop music, more rock music and Western kind of, you know, modern music, which which made a big change yeah. from the 50s through to the 60s. But the other thing that's happening is back then we didn't think about it very much. Mm. But these recordings that, that certainly I played on from 1973, which is when I started doing sessions in, in studios. Yeah. Um, those recordings, some of them are still being produced in, in, term, in terms of reproduced onto, you know, streaming platforms, vinyl. Um, and one of the decisions that I made very early on was sound. I wanted my sound to be as good as it could be within the limitations of my knowledge at the time. So I was very young, you know, I was. Yeah. 16 when I started doing uh, recording sessions and um, but I would always with my drum kit I, I always felt that uh, the, the sound of a new drum head mm -hmm. was very important for the way that I like a drum kit to sound so I would spend a lot of money on new drum heads okay and what that would mean at that time was um, I couldn't afford much else, for example. Mm. So, uh, you know, I couldn't afford to go on a vacation. I couldn't afford to travel somewhere. Or, um, um, but I just made that decision very early on, not really knowing the consequences of that, because we can't see into the future. We can only guess. Um, but looking back at it, I am so glad that I did that at that time, because now recordings are coming out of that era. Still, and the other thing that's happening is some of the tracks that were not put on the record, because remember in those days, we had a 12-inch vinyl. Mm. We had a maximum of 22, 23 minutes aside, really. So, you know, your most albums were 45 minutes long. There were other songs recorded which were just shelved and some were not finished. But now what's happening is all these record labels are trying to find and buy all the uh, catalog of certain artists and putting out these unreleased tracks, Correct. which is, uh, well, you know, is music immortal? Well, 
actually, it can last for a very, very long time as long as the technology can retrieve previous technology. Mm. And I think one of the problems we have is analog is not a problem. We know that analog will last for a very long time and it can be restored, as we've seen in movies. We've seen um, a lot of footage from uh, World War One, World War Two, taken in the field, you know, hand crank cameras, black and white. Yeah. They've been, you know, reformatted, recut or colored. I mean, it's incredible. So this can happen with music. One of the problems we have is digital music, digitally recorded music, which is stuck on a drive and we can't get it off that drive. <laughs> I have loads of SCSI drives and I still keep my old computers with the old uh, formatted, you know, uh, SCSI chassis and everything. I don't know if it's still going to work. I hope so. But this is very important that we don't lose um, data that is music, books, movies that are stored on uh, digital. Because um, I have a feeling we don't really know that it, a drive that worked four years ago that might be, uh, or let's say 10 years ago, that might be a firewall. Now we don't use firewall. We have USB, we have USB C, you know, SATA, all these different formats. Yeah. Can we retrieve that music? You know, I, I mean, I'm sure there's people that can do it, but it's a little worrying. So that's. I think that's the only issue that could uh, be a danger to uh, music, you know, being immortal. Um, but if we can get over that, the, the the confines of the technology at the time, the music is not the problem. That's there. Um, so, I mean, it's around for a long time. So you got to make sure that you always play as well as you can. <laughs> Because if you made a mistake on something, there it is for for life. <laughs> As I found out on a few videos here and there, you know. Um, but I don't think about that when I write. No, I, I, okay. I just write the music. I, I think cloud is the way to go. You don't have to depend on uh, physical devices. The cloud. Oh, uh, uh, let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. always good to have a backup. Sure, sure. Couple. <laughs> yeah. yeah the improvisational nature of drumming allows for spontaneous creativity so how has this constant problem solving during performances impacted your cognitive flexibility and creativity outside of music well it's part of playing an instrument mm. to be able to adapt very quickly okay um one of the great things is to play a piece of music that you don't know. Mm. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. Yeah. Um, reading music. Back in, in the 70s when I was doing sessions, nine times out of ten, I had no idea how this piece of music went. I just had a chart and I went, okay, what's the tempo? And the MD would give me a tempo and i go, okay. And sometimes I would go, well, depending on the session, of course, I would say, you mind if I count it in? And he said, oh, no, no, it's fine. So I'd get that tempo and I'd, I'd, uh, I'd ask him, what, what is the basic groove? And he'd kind of, you know, say, okay, okay, great. I would count it in to the whole band and then we start playing. We have no idea how this music goes. Yeah. And, but it's a very, it's a very good way to be able to pick up something very quickly. Mm. And to be able to formulate as as you're reading, to be oh yeah okay I get where this is going you know um, that's a, a wonderful way to play music and in some ways I actually miss it occasionally I do the odd club date local uh, the place called like the baked baked potato or the grape okay. you know, these are various uh, jazz clubs okay. um, somebody will pull a chart out and they go whoa okay let's 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 go you know yeah um, but the other thing of course is Back in those days, we didn't have a method of making demos. Mm. Nobody owned a, a drum machine, didn't have them in those days, or a sequencer. A lot of people didn't even own a tape recorder. So you'd get to a, a session and somebody pick up an acoustic guitar, acoustic guitar and it goes, it goes like this, ding, 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 you know? Yeah. And often 
I had a, you know, I was very young, so I had a very young sponge-like brain. I didn't need to write stuff down. I just listened to it and go, mm, okay, great, let's play. Mm. So that's all part of being able to change very, very quickly. And even if you don't know a song very well, yeah. it helps you do that. <clears throat> I think today, I don't know, there's not <clears throat> as much <clears throat> training for that for a young musician. It's like, here's the demo. Let's now play it exactly like the demo. You know, and to me, it's a bit of a shame. It takes out the spontaneity. Um, what I love about um, recording, live recording sessions, yeah. where you actually get a few musicians in a studio at the same time, you can develop things instantly. And beautiful mistakes happen too. The problem with a lot of recording today is it's all pre-recorded. Somebody will send you, uh, I'm not going to say a demo, but a basic track with a drum program and guide bass, some guitars, and maybe a guide vocal. Well, okay, but you can't suddenly change the arrangement. You're stuck. Yeah. It's restricting. Now, Sometimes, and, and this actually drives me nuts. It, it, it drives me crazy that sometimes the song is not at the right tempo. Mm. A, a sequencer plays every, every song perfect at any tempo, but the human doesn't. Yeah. When we did recording sessions, we'd go, all right, let's do another take. Let's, let's speed it up a bit. Okay, great. Or, <laughs> here's another one. Is this in the right key? Let's try this a half step up. You know, um, because maybe the singer's kind of struggling a little bit with some of the notes. Um, it's too it's too low for his register, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often these days. And I think it's it's uh, harming the way music sounds. So. Um, but you did ask how it affects things outside of music. Correct. I think any improvising musician. Mm -hmm is able to improvise on anything. Um, I remember this computer guru came around to my house, this is years ago, to, to fix some stuff that was going on with, with early Macintoshes and stuff. And uh, he needed a few things. I went, oh, okay, uh, okay, hang on. And I go out to the garage and I grab something. I said, set this up. Or, How about that? I said, oh, great, that's lovely. And uh, do you happen to have a so-and-so? And I don't remember the details. He said, and one thing he pointed out, he said, you're very good at improvising stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that happens a lot. I mean, I'll, for when we do our live shows, somebody needs a piece of equipment at that height. Yeah. And I go, hmm. And I'll go to my storage container or I'll go into the workshop and I'll and, and build something. I love doing that. So. And I think it's a way that comes from uh, definitely playing jazz and okay. improvising, thinking very quickly, how do we, how do we get around this problem? Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I look at uh, everything a bit like that, you know? Mm -hmm. If there's a, a little problem, all right, how do, how do we get around this? Rather than, oh, dear, we can't, we can't do anything because it's broken, you know, or something like that. I guess that might, might help, yeah. I've never really thought about it. Well, I, I think I think you also uh, briefly mentioned about the bare locks. Did you did you make those too? Yes. <laughs> wow, knew it, knew it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked in my workshop for yeah, you know yeah. various bits and pieces. I love uh, yeah. you know, screws, bolts, nuts, all weird shaped bits of metal, and and I found these U clamps with okay. a and threads here, and I went. Hmm, let's have a look. And I got my drill and I drilled a couple of holes in the lid and the thing. And <laughs> so I went, ah, they're too long. So yeah. I cut the, uh, I have a nice chop saw, put a metal um, cutting blade in it and put some goggles on because there's a lot of sparks. And yeah, right, there we go. Remembering to put the nut on the thread first yeah. so you can create the, you know, keep the, the thread and file it so it doesn't cut you. And it worked. It worked great. I mean, it's basic, but it works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It pissed yeah, the bear yeah. off, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I'm sure, I'm sure the bear didn't really listen to much of jazz. So, 
No, yeah. prob- couldn't, sadly, no. Couldn't <laughs> improvise as much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, I wanted to sort of, you know, put out an an- analogy and wanted to understand uh, how you sort of perceive it. Right? So, uh, while not synesthetic, have you found consistent connections between specific drumming dynamics, say for instance, uh, tempo variations or intensity of playing? Uh, how would you connect it with something like colors or shapes during performances or compositional faces like you? do usually i've seen a lot of references in some of your tracks like pentangle isosceles part of the protocol repertoire okay but what did you see in those tracks what what was what was a specifically uh, i saw references to shapes like oh yeah yeah no i i i don't think of it at all like that okay not at all. okay um there's a a friend of mine uh a dr- great He, uh, he actually—I can't remember the name of the the what what it's called. There's a word for it. He sees color when he hears a sound. I think synesthesia. Are you talking about synesthesia? Ah, is that it? Synesthesia. Yeah, yeah. yeah I right. think so. Yeah. And I was playing at Ronnie Scott's in uh, Ronnie Scott's okay. Jazz in London, okay. and he came along because he was doing an interview with me for okay. Rhythm Magazine, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were on the stage, and he, he told me about this, and I said, okay. And I took a stick and I went, right, 10-inch tom. What color? Blue. All right, what about this? Yellow. And it was amazing. For every drum, he mm-hmm. saw a color. Okay. That's great. My, I don't, the only color I see is the color of my drum kit. Which is green. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting. I, uh, uh, I, I don't see that. But what I do do, um, more from a mixing perspective okay i i visualize what it's going to sound like Mm. and i know that sounds kind of silly but i kind of have uh so every new mixing project that comes along um i listen to the music and i go hmm how should i mix this what's the concept of, of the mix and usually the first mix that you do is going to set up the template for the rest of the album. Mm. So I kind of think a little bit, and I, I actually visualize it. I actually visualize that uh, I'm going to pan. I'm going to have some hard panning in this, mono hard panning, like like an old record, like a 70s record. I'm going to put the guitar on the right. I'm going to put the horn on the left. I'm not going to have all the keyboard stereo. I'm going to reduce their spread. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And I'll okay. actually visualize it. So okay. I can visualize, visualize my pan pots. Um, one experience I've had with listening to music, especially when younger, mm-hmm. was, and I'll give you an example, Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah. I don't remember the record, but George Massenberg was the engineer. Okay. The kick drum sound was so interesting I could I could visualize the pedal working and the beta hitting the hitting the head. Mm-hmm. That's the only way I can describe that. It, I could really visualize the mechanics of the instruments, like the pick hitting the string, because it's so clear in the yeah. speakers. Um, that's that's a lovely thing. So I. I Otherwise, it's it's all oral. Got it. Uh, now I'd like to move a little bit towards reception of music from audiences as a topic. Uh, so in the realm of instrumental fusion music traditions, audiences often respond in two distinct ways. One that involves scholarly understanding of a particular musical form, which is you know, people having that intricate vocabulary and understanding the technicalities. The other one's mm-hmm. a little more intuitive and visceral responding from instinct or emotion. As a musician, yeah. which approach do you typ- typically favor and find personally engaging for yourself? Well, the problem with the music I play, jazz fusion or jazz rock, 
it it attracts mainly musicians to the audience. And sadly, most of those musicians are male. So we get a high percentage of males in the audience. Yeah. Now, but a lot of those males bring their girlfriends, which I'm very happy about. Um, but they're not all musicians, mm-hmm. and they listen with different ears. Yeah. Um, what I try to do when I present a band is yes, I'm we're displaying the music as it is, which is, yeah, it's fairly technical. It's jazz. It's a little bit more involved than, you know, straight 4-4 four, four rock and roll. But I still try to make uh, melody very important. Mm. And I still try to present the band so it's entertaining to the non-musician. Okay. Um, when I mix records, the the, the 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 one thing I do with uh, let's say very complex music, let's say like Planet X. What I try to do is to make it a, a pleasurable listening experience. Okay. Now that's difficult because not all technical music is very pleasurable to listen to. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Only yeah. to the initiated. Yeah. So I do tend to try to make it very hi-fi and very acceptable. So if somebody doesn't really understand the music, they, they are getting off on the, just the pure visceral, you know, the sound of the record. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same with the live uh, uh, concerts of protocol. Um, I, I want people to be interested in what's going on on stage. Um, and one of the reasons for going back to a five-piece instead of a four-piece was precisely that, was to bring a little more visual to the band i play drums i can't move i'm stuck the only thing you're going to see is a few arms playing around you know yeah bass players usually it's pretty static keyboard player he can't move just the arms right um guitarist well some guitarists are very static others a bit more you know uh, um animated um and I just felt with the four piece, it needed something more on stage. Um, and that's why I reintroduced Horn into the into the lineup. So at least there's two. There's two people now who are fairly animated. And the two uh, musicians that I have, Jacob Sesney on Horn and Alexander Sill on guitar, they are very animated. So it makes the band a little more interesting for the non-musician to 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 watch and i think this is very important um i remember a concert that i did uh at the red bull ring in okay. austria which is okay. a formula one circuit wow. and during off season they have they run a series of of uh concerts and they've invited me a few times to play there okay um well, the the organizers who also organize the race itself yeah. um, knew that I'm really into little afternoon with some uh, the the circuit was closed because they were uh, renovating, but they had an indoor kind of paddock where they could set up a little circuit, yeah. and they let us loose into these uh, little kind of buggies mm. with uh, two seater buggies with a with a four speed or something like that. Okay, and they had two racing drivers on, uh, uh, you know, to to sort us all out. One was a F one driver, one was an F three thousand driver, okay. and we had such a great time. It was, of course, it was winter and it was raining, and but we had a great time. We had an absolutely great time, you know. And then we invited them to the concert, okay. and there's a, uh, a another older racing driver who has a school, Walter Lechner. Um, he was quite a famous um, uh, Group C driver. Mm. Um, he's a guitarist. He loves playing guitar, so he would always come to the shows. Well, he told me this great story. He's standing there watching with the two racing drivers, and we come out and play. <laughs> and one song goes by, and one of the racing drivers goes, when does a singer come out? <laughs> 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 wow. Because he, he didn't like, really understand the music at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah, very funny. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's it's difficult. Um uh, I I do I do love it when I look out and see uh a mixed audience and not just you know a bunch of you know guys at the front 
with you know occasional uh lady you know in, in the audience it's like mm, come on you know so yeah. yeah um but i i do find that that tends to happen in the west more than the east mm. uh in japan um in in uh china in um what i've seen in, you know my small in 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 india another there do, it does seem to be more um generally more women coming to see this kind of music yeah. for whatever reason I, i'm not quite sure why but you know sure. i'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the role of music in societies the role of art in general so if if we were to consider this particular topic is there a concern that idealizing the role and purpose of music we might overlook the practical contributions of it or of in art in general right it can make within societies that are still perceived to be fundamentally marginalized or disadvantaged what is your take on something like that well music is totally international it okay. defies any form of language okay it is language right. um i used to go to france to paris to record with a uh, this is again long this is in the 70s late 70s to right. record a very famous french artist called michel berger okay uh, who was also married to france gall who mm. uh, you know uh, th- these are two big artists in france and mm. i he used to have me come over from london to play on his records. Mm. Um now most of the musicians they were all French, most of them could speak English, but there was one in particular who was a bass player. Um um this is a long time ago. <laughs> Yannick Top. That was his name. He played in a band I think he played in a band called Magma. Okay. Wonderful bass player. I called in the Anthony Jackson of France. Oh wow. He played four string with cello tuning, octave mm. down. Okay. So fifth, low C. And in those days, nobody had a bass that had a low C on it. Anthony Jackson had a low B. Um, but it was it was unusual. Yeah. Um and he only spoke French, wouldn't speak English. So every morning, you know, bonjour Simon. Oh, bonjour Yannick. Ça va? Oui, ça va bien. Oui. Yeah. And uh, that was it. <laughs> but we played music together uh, uh, seamless. And I used to count in in French too. I go, un, deux, un, deux, trois, tick dum And, you know, start playing. <laughs> um, and it was lovely, the fact that we could play music together. And this is the beautiful thing about music. It doesn't matter where somebody comes from. It, you play music, you know. Um, so and and I'm a and have been for a very long time big fan of what was called now world music you know uh I love mixing different types and styles of music and I don't know if you've heard protocol 5 there's a quite a bit of uh Indian sure. influence yeah. in there you know some I think, of the I think Jagannath the ju- the track Jagannath, Jagannath. Well, yeah Jagannath, or Jagannath which is so okay. the, the word Jagannath uh, Jagannath comes from Jagannath oh okay yeah, the British word. Yeah, I do, try. I mean, I try to do a lot of research about these these titles, but okay. and that's why it's called Yagana. You know, um, mm. is that the right way to pronounce uh, Yagana? We call it Jagannath because I'm not quite sure yeah. because there is there is a Puri. I don't know. There's a in Orissa. There is a Puri Jagannath temple. Yes, which is which is right. very popular, and they call it Jagannath in India. Maybe in Hindi, it's it's pronounced that way. Uh, Maybe the English way is, you know, probably Yaganath. Yaganath, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it's uh, so that that was very much that I really wanted to write something that used some of those lines that, that I hear, you know, John with with Shakti, you know, yeah. uh, except arranged with everybody, you know, horn and guitar and, <laughs> yeah. um, and it's because I love that music. That's the one thing I love uh, when I listen to. Uh, Shakti or uh, uh, any kind of you know Indian music that 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 does that. Hmm. I do like to use lots of different influences. Uh, 
uh, in that song. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's that's. I'd love to mix mix this. You know. Yeah, especially Protocol Five. I I believe you put it out in twenty twenty two. Was yeah. was this? I mean, when I heard it, it was it was more of a musical expedition that you had embarked on, and uh, it had some very divine tracks. So, how did you sort of arrive at that direction in terms of you know music? Mm, boy, I think it's um, a natural progression from the pre. I think every record is a natural progression from the previous one yeah yeah. but i also have to have quite a bit of time in between records because i don't want to write compositionally i don't want to write what i just wrote i want to come from a different angle so each record i try to do something a little bit different okay in the fact that it's instrumental music and um it's melodic. I, th- I think that's very important. Most melody. Mm-hmm. A lot of people ask me, you know, do, do you start on the drums with a drum groove? No, never. Maybe, maybe one song in 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 two albums would have started like that. Um, sometimes I come up with a groove and I go, great, all right, and I I. I just don't, it doesn't seem to to work like that. Um, If anything, the groove would actually come from a piano groove that I come up with, a couple of chords, that might work. But typically, I I think more, uh, nine times out of ten, it comes from a melody that I just come up with and then work down from there. I think they're the strongest uh, uh, ways of writing personally, you know. So, hmm. I don't know. I don't know what the next one's going to be. All I know is that after writing uh, Protocol Five, I was I was compositionally exa- exhausted and had really nothing more to say. So I go, go I go into other things and co-write with with different artists, different stuff. Uh, some things start to happen. So hopefully the next one will be even more different. I don't know. I'd like to play a sneak peek, maybe a minute of uh, the wonderful track that you'd put uh, as part of Protocol 5. Uh, I'd like to play it for the Indian audiences. Sure. of uh, Jagannath by Simon Phillips and his incredible group as part of Protocol 5. Thank you. <laughs> Loved yeah. it. Loved it. Just Thank gives you. me goosebumps listening to it uh, almost every time. <laughs> 
Thank what you. A, well, an incredible we're going to get to play that again pretty soon. We're doing uh, a couple of concerts in Los Angeles at Catalina's Bar and Grill, okay. uh, jazz, and then uh, two nights up in Yoshi's uh, in mm. Oakland. Okay. So we have a rehearsal uh, in a couple of weeks. So we've got to relearn everything or just remember everything <laughs> and uh, get used to playing that stuff again. You know, it's not the easiest, but uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, uh, uh, Protocol, so Protocol 1, which was done a long time ago, it was 1988, was purely just me playing all, it was all keyboards really, but playing all the parts. And it was really, they were a bunch of demos. And then I was trying to get a record deal okay. uh, at that time, and nobody was interested in that kind of music. Mm. And I had uh, built a studio because I was doing a lot of production at that time. It was 1988. And I thought, well, I'm just going to record it. I've got a studio. I might as well record it. So yeah. that's why there's no one else on it. It's just me. And I thought, let's just get it out. You know, it's yeah. it's. I need to get this music out. Yeah. Uh, which I called kind of melodic fusion, if you if you want a, a, a name for it, you know. Right. Um, it has more of a rock edge to it, um, and it's simpler than most jazz rock was at that time. Um, but it was a good start. And then many years later, obviously I did some solo albums, but many years later, um, I was recording, I uh, just asked some people, look, I've got a studio, everybody's here for the NAMM show, Let's, let's make a jam album. Mm. That's how it started. Okay. So Andy Timmons, Steve Weingart, and Ernest Tibbs, just the four of us. And um, they said, well, have you got any material? I said, well, yeah, but I'm not very happy with it. I don't, I don't really, I'll send you what I've got. So I started putting it together. Mm. And my surprise, they're going, this is great. What are you talking about? We, we, we can just, you know, modify a few things. Yeah. And as we were recording, the feeling I got with the sound of the band, I went, this deserves the name Protocol. So that's where Protocol 2 came from. And then we did a bunch of touring. I wrote more material. We did Protocol 3. But that was that was the, the length of that band. It was time to go in a different direction. Evolve. Mm. Yeah. And then Protocol 4, uh, Greg Howe joined, and uh, Dennis Hamm, who was playing keyboards, um, but then Dennis was playing with uh, Thundercat, so he couldn't make the, the tour. So that's how Otmaro came into the band. And then we did a lot of touring with that band, actually. Yeah. Um, but then it was just, I felt time to, I'd made my move up to Ojai. I'd met some different musicians. Um, I thought, oh, I think it's time to bring the horn back. So I changed the format of the band. So. And at the moment, it's still all the same. Um, I don't know what's going to happen for the next record. Not yet. Great. What has been the consolation that spirituality has brought to you? So Sorry, say again? What has been the consolation that spirituality has brought to you? Hmm. I'm not, I'm, I don't really, I don't really think very much in those terms. Okay. I'm a bit practical. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, I mean, I have my beliefs, sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 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 my spirit, spirituality, spirituality, that's interesting at this time of the morning, um, is really through music. Mm -hmm. that's i think where i connect um outside of that i think the it's more important um to to be kind okay. considerate to people yeah. respectful of people uh i think one of the big issues we've got right now and especially with the united states we've got a big divide. We've got a lot of anger. Yeah. And uh, I've seen it. I see it on the road, on, on the freeways. I see it in certain stores. I mean, and it's just, I don't know. It's its really, yeah. so I think one has to play one's part of just being, you know, kind, considerate, and aware. Uh, 
but I don't really go any further in terms of, uh, you know, um, I, I, I leave that for the music. If you, if you can understand that, that that's really, and that just comes how that comes. I don't know. I don't really question. Um, I don't, I don't think we need to actually, I think if something, if an idea comes in, I just think, well, wow, how lucky <laughs> to be able to pick up on that. It's even, you know, when when I uh, uh, somebody asked me to record on a track, I just did a track yesterday. Okay. And I they sent me the track, and I listened to it, and I go, hmm, I'm not really sure what what to play on this. I mean, that's my first thing. Yeah. But I've been doing this long enough to know that something will come, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> And that's exactly what happened. I just go out and I put the phone's on, I hit play, and I always press record, and I go, hmm, uh, hmm. And I start playing with things, and something just happens. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it's there. And I just think, wow, I'm really lucky to be able to have things to, that just come in from nowhere to create this track. Um, so I think one has to be very open, you know? Sound is a big part of it too. Do the drum sound right? Is this yeah. the right sound for this track? No, let's change the snare drum, tune it a little bit differently. Uh, maybe some different EQ, different balance of the all the microphones. You know, ah, that sounds better. That sounds more like it should be for this music. So, um, that's my spirituality. It's uh, just being open and. Uh, Hoping, hoping something will come up. It's a bit like writing music, you know. It's the same thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, yeah. you have your own perspective, your own ideology. Whatever works for you, whatever floats your boat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, in music, or life in general has a lot of hurdles and obstacles. So I'd like to know some of that that you had faced when you were. Uh, trying to build your reputation in the public sphere during your initial years with Toto. So what, what were some of the challenges that you faced? Well, specifically for Toto? Mm-hmm. Um, well, um, I'd had similar scenarios before, joining a okay. band that had had, you know, different drummers in it. Uh, the Who mainly was it was very important um, uh, to a certain extent Mick Jagger because of the Stones reputation, um, but I think nothing because the scenario was different. The, this was a group of people that had almost grown up together. Right, they grew up in the valley in uh, just uh, in uh, in Los Angeles, yeah. and played at school together. They had a school band together. So there's a long history there. Mm. Um, anytime you join a band that's got a long history, yeah. it's going to be a challenge. Um, now, the first thing I do is I don't think about any of that. The first piece of work is to learn to play the music and play the music. That, yeah. That's the first, because that's yeah. what you're being asked to do and employed to do. So I don't spend, I don't waste any time thinking about, you know, how the previous drummer would have played it. Do they like me? You know, all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm just there to, to, you know, play the music, rehearse and get ready for, for going on the road. Um, it's when you get on the road and you start doing concerts, you go, oh, wow, they've got a lot of fans, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> and you turn up in the bus and there's like people waiting and it's like, and for them, it's the first time they've seen the band without Jeff Bocaro. Yeah. First time they've seen the band with me. So obviously, I can't dwell on that. I can't think about it because you just drive yourself crazy with that, you know. Um, you just do your job and hope for the best. That's that's really all it is. Um, at the time of that first tour, of course, I had no idea that the band would even continue. I had no idea that they would even continue with me. Yeah. I, no, I just thought, well, you know, this is commitment for the rest of the year, pretty much. In uh, 1992, from uh, September 
to December, and we'll figure out what, what happens after that. But of course, during the the course of the tour, a couple of weeks in, Mike Picaro was already starting to talk about, you know, uh, how would you feel about joining this band? Mm. Wow. Now, I was, I was going through a major change in my life, too. I was leaving, I was going through a divorce, and I was also leaving England to go to live in Los Angeles. Yeah. So there was a few decisions I had to make. What do I want to do? Well, I've been doing recording sessions since 1973, actually, really since 1971, but out in the big wide world in 73. Do I really want to go through that again? In yeah. terms of, because people in Los Angeles won't know me like they do in London. Um, I went, no, not particularly. I'm, I'm not really, I don't really want to continue as a session guy. You know, I've been doing a lot of production now. Um, so I made that decision. I thought joining a band might be the best thing, actually. So that's how that happened. And uh, I joined, actually, in 1993, yeah. for real. I had no idea I'd be still in the band 21 years later. <laughs> so um and we went through a lot of things as any band that's been together for a long time you know people change uh, we all get older um we all go through different marriages and personal relationships so it's you know it's an interesting experience to to have and to have had um so it it produces its own series of, of problems um but but also i i think the the the, the public accepted me fairly quickly oh lovely there's a few yeah there's a few people said oh you know uh preferred it with jeff Picaro, but you know <laughs> well fine but then listen to those records you know um but unfortunately you know jeff wasn't able to be around yeah so Somebody had to to fill in, and I think for a lot of people it was a strange choice because you know I'm a British drummer known for being more of a rock drummer. Oh, actually, probably I was more of a jazz drummer than Jeff was, funnily enough, because I that's where I started. Yeah. Um, and um, but you know, again, you can't please everyone. Totally. You can please, that wonderful saying: you can please some of the people all of the time. You can please all the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. <laughs> you know? Or you can please some of the people some of the time. <laughs> uh, so um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, 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 you know, a certain challenge. But but uh, I just, you know, I, again, my work ethic is just get on with the job and, and do it, you know? Do you feel you've received the recognition you deserve for your work with the band? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, some of the, some of the emails I get. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. People, you know, and I think, um, of course, more of it will be to do with the the albums that we made, the new music that we all made, and uh, I was involved, you know, even on the first record with some of the uh, composition. Um, but I was also feeling my way into the band. How do they, because they've made many records, um, you know, how to how to be part of this as a production team. Well, you know, the next album I was involved in the production and a lot of the writing, and eventually I engineered um, Falling In Between, So, which was a wonderful trust. And I, I have to thank Steve Lukather for that because he had worked with me on... Um, a couple of other albums that I was engineering and he loved it. He just sold, you know. So actually I did two albums. I recorded two albums with, with Toto. Uh, the covers album that we did. Um, what's that called? Uh, gosh. I can see the cover, but I can't get the name. Is that funny? Uh, and then the last album I did was just Falling In Between. Mm. Um, so it was, and in order to be in a band, I needed to do more than just be the drummer. Otherwise, I wouldn't be interested in being in the band. So, <clears throat> to me, that was that was wonderful, and I learned an awful lot. Um, and um, the band were great. They said, "No, you engineer," and um, they were really they trusted me. And um, yeah, it, it went very well. Not an easy job. <laughs> totally, totally. You have to 
it's a yeah. tough room. Yeah, I can tell you that. in multiple things yeah, at the same time. Yeah, must have been. Oh yeah, <laughs> trying to trying to learn the music as we're writing it, play and engineer at the same time. You know, yeah, yeah it's yeah. Uh, it's a lot of responsibility. It's, yeah, yeah, it is, but it's fun. It's a it, I, I've always enjoyed doing that. What has been the most difficult part of your own life? I know it's a very hard question to answer, but what's been like the probably the lowest point and how did you tackle it? Like, how did you overcome that? Oh, well, well, there's been a few, I okay. think. I think the the first was obviously when I was very young, which is when I was playing in my father's band. Mm -hmm. I was 16 years old and he passed away very suddenly. Oh no. And that was uh that was 1973. Um I had the responsibility of his band. Yeah. His Dixieland band. But I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to play that music anymore. I wanted to get into rock and roll. So what I had to do was disband the band and basically put myself and and a few other musicians out of work. Mm. But I just felt without him it, it was so specialized, and he, he's a clarinet player, was a clarinet player. There was nobody that sounded like him. He was an absolutely beautiful uh, clarinet player with the most amazing tone. Yeah. Um, the band would never be the same with any other clarinet player. It just wouldn't be the same. And, and I'm a purist. I just yeah. think, no, that, that's the end of that era. That band should, should you know, basically be put to bed. So um, that was, you know, it was pretty tough at that time. Uh, but it's life experience, isn't it? Yeah. And I got through that, and very soon, with with uh, a bit of luck here and knowing a few musicians that I'd met through my dad's band, uh, I got the most wonderful cover to gig in in uh, London, which was uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, the the theatrical show. Oh, okay. And that was a wonderful start to to my career. Um, the other low points. Really, no, nothing out of the ordinary, really. I mean, the usual thing of being a freelance musician, being out of work for a few months. <laughs> I mean, we all experience that, you know. Um, but I think, obviously, the the, the biggest hit was uh, the 2017, the Thomas Fire. Mm. Uh, I had just moved to here. And um, I went out on tour and never saw the house again. It was gone. So um, now... Of course, you know, I'm not the on, only one. There are a lot of people that lost even their Lee, property. Even Lee Ritnor, uh, lost. The next year yeah. in the Wolsey Farm. Yeah. In fact, more that damaged more houses and more musicians actually lost their, yeah. their homes. Jimmy O, Mike Garson, um, quite a few, actually, quite a few different uh, musicians, yeah. you know. Um, but as well as non-musicians, you know, everybody suffers. So... Um, but uh, I think what followed that was the, you know, it, it got very involved, um, uh, you know, dealing with uh, with insurance company and, uh, you know. Yeah, you must have lost a lot of important things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, I'm also very, I, I don't know, uh, uh, it surprised me how, uh, I, I I was kind of okay with that in in some ways. Uh, the, the the I think the biggest hit was losing photographs of oh. of the years before, which were not digital. They were and they were analog photos, letters that I kept, diaries. Um, some of my diaries were saved, but there was a whole period that that's gone. Um, yeah, the, the, there's that. In terms of material things, <laughs> I say to people, it's a great way to clear your wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> it's great um, how I, supportive you are about I, I have to be. You yeah. know, it's yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm very fortunate in the fact yeah. that yeah. I, 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 regardless of, uh, you know, uh, what did I have left? A suitcase? I was lucky. I was on the road. I had a suitcase full of clothes. And I had a, a bag, I had some microphones, and I had all obviously my drum kits, which were not here, um, and uh, my computer. I mean, a lot of people had to just run 
and with the clothes they were wearing and grab their, you know, maybe passport and computer and, and just get out very wow. quickly. So far, it was very fast. So I actually felt very lucky that I'd actually been on the road and actually had a full you know, suitcase of clothes. Sure. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think you just have to be uh, that there's there's a lot of people far worse off. Mm. That that's the thing to remember, and you know, especially up in this area, you know, we had a big area where people were donating clothes, donating food, donating tools, everything. Mm. I mean, it, it was amazing, you know. So, and um, I just felt, you know, I'm lucky. I I still, you know, I can work. Because all I've got to do is get on a plane and go somewhere, um, you know. So, but it was it was uh, you know you learn you learn from these experiences. You learn more from those experiences than than the the great experiences. It's like it's like concerts. Yeah. Um, when you have a great gig, mm-hmm. everything comes to you very easily. Yeah. You learn nothing. Mm. Great for your ego. Woohoo, wasn't that a great gig? Wow, I played so great tonight. You know, all this stuff. Great yeah. for the ego. You learn absolutely nothing. When you have a bad gig and you're going, what is wrong? How can I get over this? Why can't I? That's when you start learning. That's that's how I look at it. So you learn from all these experiences. And uh, so in a way, they're they're really valuable. Quite an interesting take. Yeah, that's how I see it. Anyway, yeah. Uh, I'd like to know your friendship with Mohini Day, and what was it uh-huh. like working on her new album? Of course, you worked with her on several other occasions. Uh, also, part of this other project with Darwin. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, right. Well, I became aware of Mohini through YouTube. People have been saying you got to check Mohini out, you know. Yeah. And then there was a project. Uh, um, um, uh, somebody asked me to to play on a song, mm-hmm. and Mohini was the bass player. So that was the first time we had played together, but obviously separately. Where I hadn't even okay. met her yet. Yeah. And then last year, no, the year before last, I did a um, uh, cruise called "Cruise to the Edge," yeah. where Protocol were, were playing, and she was playing with a friend of mine, uh, um, Marco Miniman. Mm. Uh, and uh oh gosh uh 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 uh, uh oh gosh can't, can't remember the names right now anyway Is and that's randy, why randy maxstein yeah, randy yes yeah. exactly yes yeah. um and nick de virgilio too virgilio yeah yeah great band really enjoyed it yeah. and ernest yeah. and i were actually in the audience uh, ernest my bass player uh and we were watching you know and i was really really impressed with the way mohini yeah. played that particular music and Ernest was like, I said, what do you think? Oh, she's great, you know. So um, then fast forward to the next year, uh, 2022, um, Darwin wanted to record a new record. Okay. And he said, uh, uh, I'm really interested in uh, having Mohini play. And I said, well, I've, I haven't played with her, but I saw her play. And she sounded fantastic. I think we can do this. And that was the first time uh, we had worked together. And she was absolutely fantastic, really fantastic. And we did some more recording this year, uh, well, last year now, um, and uh, for the next album, because we've got two albums that we're working on. One's already done, and one is in the process of being done. And uh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. So, so impressed with her. Really amazing. And we have a great time. We all have a great time together, you know. Okay. So, and then she kindly asked me to play on a record. And I said, yeah, okay, let's do it. Um, and uh, again, you know, I took I took some time over it and thought about the music and thought, okay, a little bit of production in it, yeah. you know, not yeah. a straight playing track. I did some, you know, some few overdubs and, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and it was great. It was really really fun to do. Um, yeah, we have a great time, and I hope we'll be doing lots more in the future. Yeah, yeah. 
So what remaining agenda do you have for yourself? You're pretty much at the pinnacle of achievement as an artist at a very global scale. And you've nurtured the next generation of artists that includes the likes of artists like Mohini De or Hiromi. So what agenda yeah. remains for you now? Well, the most important thing is to is to keep practicing. Um, okay. what, I've, what I've discovered is as one gets older, yeah. <laughs> you start to slow down a bit. Yeah. And you get out of practice much quicker. Okay. It's a very interesting thing. So that's something I, I have to really keep uh, on top of, um, but also keep developing. Yeah. And try not to uh, keep falling into the same comfortable patterns. I think that's what it is. And mo- mostly, I would say, is performing solo. Uh, either a solo within a um, concert scenario in, in with the band, yeah. or even just uh, on a drum clinic or masterclass when you just have a drum kit and you and you have to create. Um, the The important thing is to still keep coming up with with new things. Try to learn new things, which it, it gets harder the older you get. Um, so I do. I'm very aware of that. Um, and uh, but also as a composer, you know, want to come up with some really cool music, yeah. uh, maybe slightly different direction here and there. I don't know yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I just love I love making records. That's I think if somebody says, what do you do? And I think rather than saying I'm a musician, I say I would say I make records mm. because mm. it's the one thing I love to do from start to finish. Yeah. You know. Uh, in all all areas, be it the com- composition, arranging, production, playing, engineering, um, you know, the, and putting the whole thing together, the whole project together. Um, yeah, I just want to have uh, um, you know loads of new ideas, and um, and obviously health is really important sure. because drums is a very physical instrument. Yeah. Um, so you know, just hope the health uh, keeps up with it. Um, and just the opportunity to 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 be able to take the band on the road and play. That's produce. I think that's being the bigger uh, the bigger problem right now is um, being able to get out there and perform. It's just getting very difficult because of the you know what's going on in the world. Incredible! I can't wait for what's next. Yeah, <laughs> good, lovely. Yeah, so I'd like to come to the last part of our agenda, which is a very quick. Rapid fire with uh, Simon Phillips. Shall we get started? Yep. Okay. Go on. First question for you. What is that one song that always makes you cry? There's a Peter Gabriel song mm-hmm. uh, that he first performed, I think, with Kate Bush. I'm mm. trying to think of the, the title. Oh, what's the title? And then he did it again with Sinead O'Connor. Uh, okay. that's a, it's a beautiful song. That really is quite... Tear jerking. I wish I, I just cannot get the the title right now. Um, there's, I would say, probably it's mostly vocal songs, uh-huh. but there are some instrumental songs which are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, I think one of John McLaughlin's records, Apocalypse, was uh-huh. absolutely compositionally absolutely beautiful. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, like some of the uh, is it, it is it, this is it. I think that's what it's called. Uh, the, the that that record with Mahadevan. I mean, that really is emotional. Hearing him sing. There's one passage of a Mahavishnu tune. Yeah. Uh, it's called "Dream." It's the very end part, and that's the harmonically is just so beautiful how that works. I mean, there's a lot. There's a there's yeah. actually a but it's hard to pinpoint each one at short notice. I think the Peter Gabriel song that you were referring to was Don't Give Up. Was it Don't Give Don't Up? Don't Give Up. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. 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 On, on the contrary, what is your favorite guilty pleasure song? Do you have one? <laughs> guilty pleasure song? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I used to play with a, an artist called Toya Wilcox. Okay. And I. Uh, we had so much fun, and it was so different for me at the time. I had just finished playing with with um, Stanley Clark mm. and Jeff Beck, Jeff Beck. 
Okay. And Jack Bruce, and and then r- right then, a producer asked me to play on a record, hmm. and um, it was actually the request. I just found out because I, I had lunch with him in London just recently. The yeah. guitarist who was the co-writer of all those songs, the main writer, really, Joel. He actually told me, well, actually, it, I was the one that asked our producer to give you a call. Mm-hmm. It was a, it was just a tune with yeah. drums and voice, actually. Oh. <laughs> and I'd heard of Toya because she was in the pop charts, you know, yeah, yeah. punk. She was a punk, uh, you know, uh, artist, really. And I got this call, and I went, "Me? Really? Are you, are you sure you got the right person? Oh yeah, okay." So I turned up at the Marquee Studios with my big drum kit, yeah. and we had such a great time. And it was the first time. I was the oldest person in the room. Yeah. They were all younger than me, except for maybe the, maybe the producer, but he wasn't that old. It was it was like so when then they they I think I recorded something else and they said, Do you want to come out on the road with us? And my initial response was, No, no, of course not. I mean, and then I thought about well, actually, why not? It's only a short tour. And that's how that started. So we did a couple of albums. Um, and there's a couple of songs I can't remember. There's a, an album called The Changeling. Okay. And there's a couple of great tunes on there. The one one uh, track I did was Good Morning Universe. Okay. And it's a pop song. And But I really enjoyed it. And I still love listening to it today. So I guess you could call that. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Nice. If you could remix any album by an artist, no matter how improbable they might seem, what would they be? Ooh, yeah, now you're talking. Um, oh, yes, there's a few records I'd like to remix, actually. <laughs> um, ooh. Uh, um... I would love to remix uh, some of the uh, early Mahavishnu records. Lovely. Uh, uh, I I'd love to mix some of the outtakes yeah. of uh, one of Billy Cobham's records. It's a live record called Shabazz. I felt there was some other tune because I was at the concert. I felt there were some other tunes that should have been on that record, which didn't make it for whatever reason. Um, uh, yeah, there's a few. There, there, there's a few records, mainly because of the the older uh, ones where we didn't have the kind of sounds that we have now. Um, oh boy, there's probably actually quite a few. But on the other hand, I mean, for example, <clears throat> Steve Wilson, he <clears throat> he's remixed quite a few of, of older records. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there was one um, record which I tried to get a hold of the vinyl. Yeah. And it's one of my favorite records, and that's Jethro Tull. Oh, okay. And it's called Thick as a Brick. Mm. It's actually a wonderfully mixed record. The engineer was Robin Black uh, at Morgan Studios, and um, I used to work with him. And it's all manual, all no, no automation. And so we used to do them in sections. We would do that section and then edit it all together. And that's how I learned to mix, actually. Um, and... Uh, uh, I haven't heard Steve Wilson's remix because I couldn't get the album for some reason. It was out of stock, but I'm very interested to, to see what, what he did actually. Uh, I believe he's done a few of those. So, uh, and he is incredibly talented. Absolutely. Porcupine tree. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, in fact, you know, I was recently re- uh, listening to a lot of music videos and he gives a lot of emphasis to sound in, you know, the whole, uh, 5.1 Dolby at Moss surround yeah. and all of that. I think oh. it sounds sounds great. I mean, unparalleled. Yeah. I mean, two two guys I've loved listening to at home in my home theater system would be Trevor Trevor Rabin and uh, uh, Stephen Wilson. Yeah. Well, you see, Trevor yeah. was, I've known Trevor for a long time. I remember yeah. his demos that yeah. he made on a little four track reel to reel. And I used to have four track Porter studio. Yeah. And um, you know, I made some pretty good sounding demos on, on that on that machine. And then he asked me to play to do a record with him. And he went over to his house and heard his demos. I went, 
wow, amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah. He always had a great ear for, sure. you know, engineering and sound and beautiful guitar sounds and, and a very funny person as well. Yeah. He, we, we had a lot of laughs. He, he was brilliant. I haven't seen him for a long time, but back, back in the 70s, early 80s maybe, um, before he joined Yes, uh, really wonderful. And I got to meet the so good friend of mine, Gavin Harrison, plays drums with Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have quite a bit of a history because his father used to play trumpet with my dad's band. Oh wow. Is that amazing? Yeah, so amazing. Uh, Bobby, is that so Bobby and I used to get on great. He was my favorite trumpet player that my uh, dad had actually. Mm. Um and so we have a re- very interesting history there. Um invited me to the show in Los Angeles. And I got to meet Steve for the first time. Okay. And, uh, of course, the concert was amazing. And uh, <clears throat> I, I hadn't met him before, so I was just about to leave. And I thought, oh, you know what, I'm just going to say a quick hello. And I went, excuse me, Steve, just wanted to say hello. My name is Simon Phillips. Really beautiful concert. And he said, you play on one of my favorite albums. And I went, really? <clears throat> and I think it was, I think he mentioned it was Duncan Brown. Mm. Intro. And uh, I went, yes, absolutely. And I actually was ending, I ended up producing Duncan. And he wrote, uh, I think, a song for David Bowie that was on one of his big albums. Um, I can't remember the, I can't remember the tune, but uh, yeah. So there was kind of a ni- nice little conne- con- connection. Connection, there. yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, but uh, maybe one day Steve and I work together. That might be yeah. nice. I, I, yeah. I can't wait. I mean, the, the very idea yeah. sounds very appealing to me. Yeah, well, he's already got a very good drummer, so. <laughs> well, you know. well, that'll be a great collaboration. So. Yeah, yeah, that would be fun. Okay. I have one, one last question for today. Yeah. If someone were to write an autobiography about you, what would be the epitaph? How would you like to be remembered? What would you like people to conclude? Um, I think for me, the biggest compliment I've ever had, and I've had it a few times, is musicality. Okay. Um, and that more than anything is the for me the biggest compliment that I have musicality. Yeah. And uh I would say uh uh the the the, the most musical drummer that makes the best cappuccinos. <laughs> <laughs> great answer for a closure this interview will be additionally aired on big fm shillong and azol two incredible radio stations in the northeastern part of india and it will also wow. be out on my youtube channel aditya veera 1994 and it will also be streaming on all audio platforms ranging from spotify to apple Podcasts. name it It's been such an incredible blessing, honor, and a privilege, Mr. Phillips. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope you enjoyed being on the podcast. Very, very much. Yes, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Lovely. And hello to all all your, you know, all the people that that see your program and all the fans out there. And and I do hope to, you know, get back to India at some time very soon. Would love to. Really would love to. Do do stay in touch and I'd I'd love to help you out in any any capacity. Okay, great. Wonderful. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Breakfast time. (laughs) Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.